The following is an interview with the Gastonia Honey Hunters, Josh Sala. I first encountered the fascinating tale of Josh Sala when I was in college, and he was a first round draft pick of the Tampa Bay Rays. Josh struggled through years of limited play in the minor leagues due to off the field issues and substance abuse, culminating in his eventual release from the Rays. It was around this point in 2015 that Josh Sala fell out of my consciousness, as well as the collective consciousness of the sports world. Another tragic story in the harsh world of professional sports of a kid who couldn't be helped because he couldn't help himself. Fast forward to May 22nd of this year. It's the first preseason game of the Gastonia Honey Hunters inaugural season. I'm covering the Atlantic League and I'm scouring a leaked Honey Hunters roster sheet to finally figure out exactly who is on this team. Imagine my surprise when my eye falls on one line. Josh Sala, Seattle, Washington. Since then, it's been a wild ride for Josh in the Atlantic League. For most of the season, he's led the league in home runs. He's navigated slumps while openly being pitched around more often than any hitter I've seen this season. And he's done it with spark. When I was at the Honey Hunters' first regular season game, it was in person that I saw Josh lead off the ninth inning with a walk. He immediately stole second, then third, putting himself in position to score on a ground ball to short just four pitches after he reached first. He crossed the plate, pumping his fist. That run cut the Barnstormers' lead to 10-2. to But that was never the point, was it? See, one can't walk the path that Josh has walked while taking innings off and not making the most of the opportunities that life presents. That goes for off the field and on it. In this interview, I chose to not dig up the past. Anyone who's ever done or said something they regret knows that those things never fully leave your head or your heart, and nothing good comes from crudely jabbing a wound no matter how healed it may be. Instead, the discussion focuses on how Josh Sala found his way back to professional baseball in its most humble form, the independent leagues, how he has changed since his trials in the Tampa Bay Rays organization, and what this unique season has been like combined with even more unique situations, including playing for a brand new organization. We also talk about something near and dear to Josh and his teammates, breakfast. You'll note that we picked this conversation up midstream. I changed recording devices after a couple minutes of talking, suspecting that I wasn't picking up clear audio, and I was correct, so I'm glad I did that. At the point that we'll pick up our conversation, Josh has just finished discussing what the fan support was like in Gastonia, and how the immediate support from the local community has had a positive effect on the players as they navigate an especially difficult Atlantic League South division. With that, I step out of the way for my conversation with Josh Sala things there especially talking about like the atmosphere gastonian atmosphere around the team um yeah i mean sticking on that might as well this team has done unexpectedly well i think by any standard whether it was uh, we really were unsure what this whole roster looked like until you know uh, just a week or so before the season started to just the how hard it is to compete in the atlantic league as a new organization what's it about the group of guys right now that's got you guys winning it's got you guys i think i posted something on Twitter the other day, not to quote myself, but here we are, Josh, that said something along the lines of this team is great because it seems to have a bunch of guys that are just sort of randomly brought together from a little bit of everywhere, and they'll go out there on any given day and beat Lexington. So I mean, is there something about this mix of guys that just makes it work, or what do you see from being in the clubhouse? Uh, I think our guys are at the core of what they want to do. They want to play baseball and win. Um doesn't really matter who it is that's in that locker room um that I've met so far. Um and like I said, I don't I don't know the exact process of how the the team got brought together, but are we got a pretty close knit group. Um like everybody's everybody's got their their share to bring to the table and they try their hardest or their damnedest to bring it every single time. So um, that's what I've noticed about the guys that we have is um, some people we've, – we've got some veterans that, that have had MLB service that know how to go about it. Um, and then we got some kids that are they're, – they're new to pro ball and they're learning how to – they're learning how, how pro ball is. So they they're they're learning on the fly, and they're doing a really good job of it. Um, and then you got the guys that have been there before and maybe taken some time away, 
and then trying to get back into pro bowl that know what they have to do. And yeah, I think all that, I think that setup that we have just, that's how it came together. But, um, everybody knows what they have to do and they try to bring their share to the table every single time we go out and play. I'm sure some of that veteran influence as well helps with certain games like, I don't know, in Lancaster where you're in the hour four and it's putting up football scores. So in a couple of ways, I'm sure that's helping to kind of keep things even keeled in that locker room. Uh, now I'm going to, we, we've kind of talked about how the season's gone a little bit. I am going to back up a little bit to do a little, how do we get here? Because it is, I think in my opinion, which is as humble as can be because I'm uh, running an Atlantic league blog and it's a big, big world out there on social media. But uh, I would say, I mean, outside of, Shohei Otani, this might be the most interesting story I've followed in baseball in like years, is on the scene, I was talking to High Points broadcasters on uh, that first exhibition game y'all played, and looking at the box, we're going, is that Josh Sala? And they were like, no, it can't be. And I was like, uh, you know, baseball reference was suggested it is. So it was kind of that out of the blue that all of a sudden popped on the scene here. So if I were to back it up, I don't feel that I need to rip open like the years of your life from 2010 to 2015, but it's obvious from where I'm sitting that you are a totally different person in many ways than who you were when we met you as a prospect. I remember in college watching ESPN being like, oh, that's an interesting story, and then kind of going out and learning absolutely nothing from that. But um, I guess looking at the prospect we met back then to now, how are you different off the field, and how does that reflect on the field? Like, how does that translate? Um, without getting into a lot of gruesome details, I'm a completely different person off the field. Um, it's, uh, what I do now is I try to, first of all, take care of my relationship with me and my higher power. Um, it's, it's something that I wouldn't be able to navigate life without. Um, and then... I I have to should I just drop this like I I have to maintain my sobriety. Um, I I'm somebody that um, does not need to be indulging in nightlife anymore. I got plenty of that in my early twenties <laughs> and stuff like that. So um, I sobriety is huge for me because without without that, not a whole lot else operates. And um, I'm a I have a six-year-old son now, and my girlfriend, Carmen, the mother of my son, uh, we stay together. Um, we don't, I don't have any interest in going out, and, and back when I was a prospect, that's all I was interested in doing. Um, so, there was a kid, when I was a prospect, I was a young kid, um, with a lot of money and probably too much bravado, um, and not not a whole lot of sense of of why things were actually the way they the way they were. Um, and between then and now, like life has been able to show me that um, whether I whether I'm in the picture or not, baseball is going to continue to go. Just such is life as well. So. Um, I'm grateful for being able to be back in the baseball world. And um, I really try not to take anything for granted now that I'm back in, in on the baseball team. Um, I am thankful for every day that I, I wake up not only in life, but in baseball as well. And I mean, from what you just said there and from what I think is able to be gleaned sort of from watching from the outside in, it seems like, you know, baseball at some point had to become the afterthought. I mean, this seems like, uh, this opportunity seems like a product of the changes that you've been able to make off the field. So at, at what point in this process were you, I mean, were you always looking for, you know, the opportunity to get back into baseball or at what point really did it become the focus of like, Hey, here's my goal. I want to play pro ball again. Um, I think through a lot of the struggles that I was having away from the field, it was always in the back of my mind. 
but as I started to clean up my, my act a little bit and start to get things together and realize what was really important away from the field, um, it was about probably two and a half years ago where I, I was, I was working out again and I was, I was helping coach, uh, back home. And, uh, I, I was hitting and, uh, I, I was feeling my body and just kind of taking inventory of what I was physically at that moment. And, um, I was like, I, I feel like I can still play and not just play. I feel like I can play and produce. Um, and I, I talked over it with, uh, with Carmen, my girlfriend, and I was like, I, I think I need to give this a run so that there's no unanswered questions. Um, and from then on out, I took, two years to train and get into what I considered my playing shape. Um, and I realized that 208 playing weight probably wasn't going to happen. That was <laughs> me when I was 20. And now I just turned 30. So um, I had to be realistic with where my body weight was going to be. Um, but we did the, we did our best collectively. Um, she helped me with diet and everything to get me, um, where my best playing shape was. And then I decided to go out and I reached through some avenues and tried to figure out how to get back into affiliate ball and what was the best way to do it. And, um, with knocking down A, B, and C, we're now here. So, um, it was, it's been a journey, but it, it took, it took some time. Wow. So you, I mean, according to my math, you were then fully away from baseball for two, three years then. Uh, I didn't, I didn't play a competitive, I haven't played a competitive game of baseball professionally since I was, since my 2014 season. Um, and my first game back was uh, a tryout that I went to through prospect dugout for the for the ALPB in 2020 August. Yeah, and that actually, I don't want to move on too quickly because it is it absolutely kind of unreal. For you know, I, I won't move on quite yet. So now, was Carmen right on board with this too? Like first time you brought it up, did she give you that look like you might be crazy, or did she give you that look like you might be crazy, but I'm in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah um if there was there was a point that um it was it was like if we're gonna do this we're we're throwing the whole kitchen sink at the situation which we're still in um like we're we've been in it when i when we made the decision it was either you're gonna do this 150 percent or you're not doing it at all which is fine with me because that's how I operate anyway. And she operates the same. So it's like, um, either we're, we're going to do this or we're not going to do this. I'm not going to do this half ass because I did plenty of that when I was a prospect back in 2014 and before. So, um, it, she looked at me a little strange the first time, but when she, when I kept bringing it to her, she was like, all right, let's do it. Man, that is it's not, the the number of things that seem to have had to come together. I mean, uh, for your thirtieth, because now I have to follow her because she is my main source of Honey Hunters content. When you guys are either at home or somewhere that isn't broadcasting games, so I think she has posted something with like the list of things that have gone into this. And I was like, man, she has built herself an entire new resume. I'm sure after <laughs> just on the support staff for this career, it's been incredible. The the teamwork coming from you two has actually been really fun to watch. Um, and not to mention, as I said, she's about half of my Honey Hunters content, depending on where you guys are playing. Uh, now, we are talking, so you said that you tried out through Prospect Dugout, correct? Correct. That's, that's kind of how, uh, that's one of the avenues that I found to get back into, uh, or into independent ball. So that's, that, that is endlessly fascinating to me because from most of what we see with Prospect Dugout, it's guys who, 
never really sort of got their shot or coming from a D3 ball or something, or you get your Riley Hovis, for instance, who shows up and we're like, who is this kid? He's just a local signee, okay? Like, a lot of them are publicity signings by teams, and all of a sudden he's getting signed by an organization. But, I mean, that's a pretty unique avenue for a former first-rounder. So, I mean, it that – I guess, how did the Honey Hunters approach you with this? Did they sort of, were they right on board right away? Did they sort of look at you like, how did you end up here and how did we get this lucky? I mean, how does that first conversation go? Because this is the first time I've even gotten an interview somebody who went to Prospect Dugout Avenue, and it's such a unique situation. Um, so the Honey Hunters were a brand new team. Um, mm-hmm. And prior to the, prior to going to the trial, I didn't, I had no idea what to expect, to be honest with you. Um, I, I wasn't sure of what the operating procedure was in this situation. But um, with my past, with my past experience and behaviors, it's like I was treating it like I was just. I was treating it because it is this. I'm just like everybody else that wanted to show up to that tryout. Um, I just kind of had a little bit of resume behind me, Um, but I wanted to leave everything on the table. And um, they said, congratulations, after the tryout was over, they said, congratulations, Um, you've been selected by the Honey Hunters. And I think a month or two later, I talked to to some of the people with the Honey Hunters, and they said, you have a, a chance to compete for a spot. And um, I wasn't looking at it as I'm a shoe in. I'm looking at it as I have to earn everything that I am envisioning or everything that I want to do, I have to earn it. So um, that's kind of the mentality that I've kept because, uh, like I said previously, when I was a younger, when I was a younger prospect, I took a lot of stuff for granted. And uh, I I try my damnedest not to do that. Now he you are absolutely terrorizing pitching staffs, Lily. That's uh that's quite a jump, man. That's impressive. The, uh, I appreciate. I'm really I'm trying to even th- like I've searched through every bit of Atlantic League history, and there's been I mean maybe one or two guys who have just out of nowhere come out and had the start that you have. And I mean, out of nowhere, of course, is relative because you do, as you said, have the resume, but uh, somebody just coming from, I guess, off of the beaten path straight into the Atlantic league and doing what you've done has been very impressive. So I'm glad that that came together for you. I'm glad it came together for the honey hunters because good things for the honey hunters are good for the league and you are a very good thing. So, um, I guess we'll transition our conversation a little bit toward life in the Atlantic League because it is a unique experience. And then we'll, uh, I got a few sort of quick hit questions and we'll see our way out of this one. But okay, uh, the first thing that I, I mean, the first thing I talk about with just about any player I run into at this point is uh, the Atlantic League and the various rules of the Atlantic League. So I'll, I'll kind of give you an open floor to not talk your way into any trouble, but uh, obviously you got the MLB test rules with the Atlantic League. So, I mean, are there any rules that are different that you really like? Are there any that you really don't like at this point and you wish would kind of be looked at again? Or are there any like existing normal major league rules that you'd actually like to see changed or tested in the Atlantic League? Um, uh, to be honest with you, I'm going to stay away from the major league rules and just and just apply what I've experienced and that I experience on the daily with with the Atlantic League, um, um, TrackMan has been it's been interesting to get used to, um, and that's <laughs> that's about as far as I can go. Um, but it's knowing that you the one thing that I that I don't um, that makes me uncomfortable not uncomfortable. What what am I looking for? One of the things that it takes away from myself as a player is kind of me establishing with the guy behind the plate, whoever's calling the game, that kind of interaction where, um, hey, is that as far as we're going to go? Is that the bottom? Is that is that the corner? Um, do I have another ball off there? Or do you have another ball off there? 
and kind of getting a feel for for that. Um, but it, I think there's a positive and a negative. I I don't. For me, it's I know I have a pretty good idea of where that zone is, um, and since it's a robo um for the majority of the time it's not going to call outside of that but so you you got a pretty good idea but every now and then you'll get that one call where not sure if it was it was the zone or if if it, it somehow changed but you'll get a call that's completely different from whatever pattern that it had set up and uh it'll catch you by surprise um, but one of the big things for me is I, I try to, I try to have an idea of where that zone is and not leave it to track man. Um, and, and stuff like that. I understand it's a, it's a part of this league and it's, it has been. So, um, uh, I don't know what its future is, but it, as of right now, it's the circumstances that I have to play under. And other people do as well. So if other people got to deal with it and I got to deal with it, so be it. Um, I try not to, to think into it too much. Um, and one of the other interesting ones that, that I, it's been, I've needed to get used to is the, the DH double switch. Um, oh. and it's, it's interesting. Um, and I, I guess I don't quite understand it. That, other than for what it's worth at face value, um, like I, I, I don't understand how the, the managerial mind goes into to orchestrating everything. Like when it comes down to the actual decision of, okay, do I, what do I do with this? Uh, if I pulled this starting pitcher, you know what I mean? Um, it's forced a lot of, it's forced a lot of decisions. Um, and I, I'm not the guy, I'm glad I'm not the guy that has to make that decision. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, that's, that's about it for me, like in terms of rules, uh, on the, on, on what's in place here in the Atlantic League. Um, and those are probably the only ones I'm going to speak on because those are the only ones I have experience with as of right now. Yeah, well, you you got the big ones, I'll tell you. The uh, yeah, Trackman, I'm actually going to let you off the hook, especially because I'm working on a longer term sort of video breaking down that. So I don't want to give away all my own content here, but that uh, that double switch DH is interesting. I'm seeing beyond just destroying my scorecard every time I try to keep one. It's uh. It's the interesting question of, okay, where do you put your DH then if you might be a pitcher in the fourth inning? And the, I know we even sort of identified, I think it was week one or two, somebody from West Virginia got hurt on the mound in the first inning and we were like, huh, maybe we should not be punishing teams who lose a pitcher due to injury in the first inning. So that's definitely been part of the, the conversation around this, but it's, a, it's interesting from your perspective. It's, uh, I mean, how do the pitchers feel about this? What's your read on that? Do they is it a guy by guy thing? Who wants to be up there raking and who wants to be staying far away, or what's the deal? I don't I don't really know their view on that. Um, I haven't I haven't asked and haven't ran it past them. Um, so at least for me, it's from a position player and just myself, I I don't know what they think. Um, that, I think that'd be a question for them. Caleb Burles feels like a hitter. That's all I'm saying. I feel like that dude, I feel like he can hit. He hit 250 at one point this season. I'm just saying. that That's all I want to see. I want to see which lanky relievers can just get up there and swing it. That's all, Josh. Is that so much to ask? Daddy hacks only. Daddy hacks only. Like, we're not playing kid games. 3-0, swinging. I don't care if you're a relief pitcher. Let's get this thing. I'm not out here relying on the zone to give us the walk. Um so, bringing it home, I mean, I have a couple quick ones before we go our separate way, kind of slowing up around third, coming into home here. Uh, the first one, I guess, would be we'll work from most serious question to very much least serious question. Uh, typically, in this situation, I'd ask the old, like, hey, if you were to get in a time machine and meet your 
fry yourself, you know, hot tub time machine or otherwise. But uh, I'll go this way, where if looking back on like sort of how the the road that you've been on and, and the journey that's been, if at some point in the future your son is hoping to go pro in a sport, what advice would you give him based on what you've learned in your own life? Play hard. Play hard. Um, don't act like you're somebody because there's always somebody better. Mm. And take care of what you can control because there's a lot of stuff that you can't. Um, as long as you take care of what you can control, that. <laughs> I used to. Anyway. This is not my original line, but I'm going to use it. And uh, take care of what you can control and take care of yourself so nobody else has to. Whew. That uh, that feels like a daily reminder to almost everybody I've ever met who's playing ball. That's, uh, that's a good bit of insight, Josh. Yeah. Thank that's you. Cool. All right. 30 and just spouting out wisdom, man. <laughs> um, now, as I said, we're going to be working from serious to least serious here, but this might be an even more serious question. So part of covering the Atlantic League is, it, as you might be able to imagine, it's just digging through old articles and going down YouTube rabbit holes and trying to figure out what's going on because sometimes information can be limited. And I found a little something here. And that seems to be you on a practice mound getting work in within the past year. At one point, pulling 90 miles an hour. Are we going to see you on a mound? This is probably, as I said, the most serious question I have for you today. Um, hopefully, the game doesn't get to the point where I need to be on the mound. But <laughs> I have let people know that in case they need somebody – a position player, I am capable of throwing. I feel like this is one of those things where we've accidentally spoken this into existence. So I'll, uh, I'll be watching games closely this week. Uh, I mean, and the gauntlet's been thrown down because me want to hit Blake Galen out there with a 1.6 ERA still for Lancaster. So I don't know. Uh, might have to do a, a player, a position player pitching type of Cy Young award here. But I will uh, definitely be keeping an eye on that. And good to know you've had the conversation. I like where your head's at with that. Uh, now, looking back from pitching to hitting, here's a big one. Gastonia Honey Hunters Home Run Derby. Let's assume you're going to win. I'll give you that. But who's going to give you the most problems? Ooh. It's a neck-and-neck race between Tapia and Skull. Ooh, yeah, Skull's kind of come out of that. That wasn't my pick for the year. It was him smacking double-digit home runs this early in the season. But, yeah, I forgot Tapia's also hanging around hitting them, too. And now you got Jason hanging around that uh, who just always seems able to hit one out, whether he's doing it or not. So that is – it is one of the most interesting home run derby lineups out there. That's why the question had to be asked. For the record, this would be – we'll call it neutral park. We won't go to Gastonia with that left field wall that you got going on. So. Maybe it'll help out the lefties a little bit more. Yeah, t- the copy and skull can hit home runs with the best of them. So, yeah, yeah that there have been a lot of updated projections since we got eyes on both of them in this league. Uh, and I guess as we're comparing teammates, I got one more question for you here. So, if it's between, we'll go Jake, Mike, and Boog. Who has the best breakfast game, and who has the worst? Jake, Mike, or Boog? I like Mike because he likes what he likes. I, I'm I'm also a vet. Like what I I eat what I like. But Skull Skull likes some variety. Um, he got some croissant pancakes the other day, and I oh. was I was. Not directly asking, but if he left a bite on his plate, I would have helped him. Um, and Boog, Boog, Boog likes his chocolate chip pancakes. 
which I'm, I've questioned myself a couple of times on whether or not I should go that route, but who's got the best breakfast game? They're all pretty neck and neck, but Skull throws in some variety every now and then that might, that might put him, uh, half a step a, ahead, but you, it, they can, anybody can win that race. Okay. Any given day, it could be anybody's race as far as breakfast goes. That's, that's a well-rounded team right there. I think that's, that's good team construction. You want good variety and good consistency still across the line for breakfast. So I'm, I'm glad you got that going. And, and I don't know what it says about this team or about my life that I already knew Booth Powell was a chocolate chip pancake guy. So that is, uh, if you asked me before the season, hey, uh, what do you think you're going to learn this year? I didn't think it would be Booth's go-to breakfast order, but, uh, here we are. I also didn't think uh, just sitting down and talking to you as you absolutely demolished every Lampy pitcher you came across. So uh, I, I guess I've always liked the idea of opening up the floor a little bit as we end the discussion. Anything that you want to uh, say to end this thing? Anything that you would like to promote? Anything you'd like to shout out or uh, anything as we let this thing, uh, I guess, run its course and allow you to get on the road for a bus? Go Honey Hunters. Go Honey Hunters. That seems to be uh, it across the board. Go Honey Hunters. E- even when the website came out, GoHoneyHunters.com. I was like, all right, that's what we're doing. Very cool. Josh Sally, thank you so much for your time, man. I really appreciate it. You were a terrific person to talk to, extremely insightful, and you are uh, my favorite person to root for. And I and I make no qualms about whether or not I'm going to pick favorites. I absolutely do. It, between you and Preston Ganey, I got rooting interest just about every night. So thank you for that. Thank you for uh, sort of leading out this new team in the league. It's been good for everybody in the league and everybody around the league. So thank you so much for not only your time, but uh, the great work you put in this year. I appreciate that, Ryan. And thanks for, thanks for the call. Absolutely, Josh. You have a good one now.